All right. The 24-hour notice. Are you ready? I'm going to start out with a question. If you were, again, it's kind of a, a, a strong one. If you were given a 24-hour notice that you were going to die tomorrow night, you knew that in 24 hours your time on earth was over, what's the first two things, if you weren't restricted by money, if you had no, no limitation, what's those, I shouldn't say first, what's those last two things that you would want to do? Maybe somebody would want to go to a country and jump off something. I mean, I want you to kind of, I want to take two minutes in the room and just let your imagination run wild. They don't have to get religious on me. And, oh, I'd kiss my kids. I mean, if that's what you want to do, great. That's one of your two wishes. But just, just think, just think for 60 seconds, all right? Just go there with me. It'll help. 60 seconds. You got 24-hour notice two things that you could do, no restrictions, no limitations. I'd love to do that before I breathe my last breath. What would you choose? Just smile when you're thinking about it. You don't have to get so serious. <laughs> like my answers are probably going to blow you away because they're like not very spiritual, but... <laughs> I mean, you have to say get married. I mean, <laughs> you're kind of, you're cornered, bro. You, you better watch it. I won't call on you. Though. I won't. Sure. All right. Is anybody who has at least one thing that you would do? All right. Hiram, I want you to shout. What's one thing that you would do? Okay, sweet. Would Elon Musk be in there or not? <clears throat> you, well, you brought, you need to win him to the Lord because if he got 24 hours, you better. Who else? Quan? I would make a big meal and invite people for dinner and serve them. Okay. And play games. <laughs> All right. Yep. Whoa, get her a microphone. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Come on. I <laughs> love you. Come on, I'll give you a $20 bill later. Okay. Just break you up. Start planting people in the crowd. No, no, I'm just Who else? Who else? Yes. Come on. All right. Who else? Yes. You want to see the northern lights? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Come on. Jump out of a helicopter. That's what's up. Who else? Give me two more. guy. Hiram said he can write it. He's a... Maybe I know something you don't know. No, I'm just kidding. Over here, somebody over here. Yes. All right, Willie. Don't be the oddball. I'd make sure I left, I left a lasting impression of how important the Lord is to your life. Oh, brother. <laughs> Amory, what would you do, man? <laughs> oh, God. 
And, and this is what I have to look forward to with the church. This is, this is, this is exactly it. The big giver just walked out the door. Somebody just filed a harassment lawsuit on him. Lord, protect the children. Who else? <laughs> Stacy, what would you do? Come on. Go to Israel. We're going next year. Yeah. yeah, we're going next summer. All right. Well, let's look at John 13. Oh, man. I mean, I'd... If the Miami Hurricanes were in the national championship, I mean, I'd, I'd go to a Canes game. No, no. All right, y'all, so John 13. I've been having this conversation with the Lord recently about the last 24 hours of Jesus' life, which is why I asked the question. Jesus has 24 hours before he dies. And we're about to read what his choice is to do before he dies. So John 13, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I just felt a pause from the Holy Spirit just to let someone know tonight that Jesus is going to love you to your last breath. There is no older person that's too far away from the love of God. He loved his boys to the very end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, taking a towel, he girded himself about. Then he poured water into the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? I'm asking tonight that the Holy Spirit would give us fresh eyes to look at Jesus. He's got 24 hours left on earth. And his choice is to wash the feet of his disciples. got 24 hours I mean the way that I look at it is in 24 hours he washes their feet to demonstrate radical servanthood he then surrenders his will in the garden of Gethsemane to the father and then three he lays down his life for his friends Praying that that kind of humility and that kind of servanthood and that kind of not about me would be like fresh anointing upon us tonight and upon this movement. Really believe the Lord's been talking to me about a greater realm of servanthood and foot washing a greater realm of giving, a greater realm of sacrifice 
a greater realm of laying our lives, our preferences, our demands. I think so oftentimes we like to emphasize the word authority and the charismatic movement and say, he gave them authority to cast out devils, heal the sick. So we look at authority to be used as power over the demonic realm. But you, do you know that Jesus also gave them authority over their ego and their pride and their need to be first? It's one thing to wield that charismata, that power and gifting, which oftentimes leads us to be seen by men. But what about stewarding God-given authority in the realm of foot washing and being on a race to be last? It's just something that I, I, as I've been studying the last couple of weeks, you just get freshly convicted where you're like, man, the Christian air that I breathe 24-7 is constantly pumping oxygen, that there's some race to be seen and heard and get to the top and be the best this and the best that. And then when you look back at the life of Christ, you think, wait a minute, I've got caught in a race modeling myself more after a Pharisee and a religious leader than Jesus Christ. Because the Pharisees and the religious leaders were all about being seen by men. It was all about outward appearance. It was all about puffing themselves up to look good. I was reading this quote by Andy Bird. He says, why are there so many books on leadership and so few books on radical serving? It's because serving doesn't sell books. Leadership evokes feelings of influence, title, and position. Serving produces fear that we will never be noticed or have our moment of fame. Who wants to buy a book on how to not be first, noticed, patted on the back, sat in the middle of a room and affirmed, clapped for, or to even have a known name? All the while, Jesus sits in the shadows, the lone author of true servanthood, looking for those who will carry his DNA. If we're going to compete, and I don't really endorse competition because it's the spirit of the orphan. Son daughters don't have to compete because they know that all that they need the Father has already given them. But if you just can't get away from competing, might I encourage you to compete for the last spot? Let's have a race tonight. Well, what's the race? Not to the place of high position who can clean up first it's already gotten very awkward praise the Lord <laughs> isn't it weird in our culture I was thinking about this we've become so entitled that by talking about this we ought, we're already doing the orphan activate thing we know the Holy Spirit activate but now we're doing the orphan activate, if you know the song. Holy Spirit. You guys know that one? 
the orphan activate works too. Where when we talk like this, people feel like we're demeaning them. They, they, they automatically get offended. But brother, what are you saying? I'm not valuable. I'm not loved. I'm not seen. I'm not cared for. We go down all, all of these, these things missing out on the point that Jesus tells his secrets to friends. You can't hear his whisper unless you get close. Once you get so close, close to his heart, you realize how much he loves you and he loves other people. Serving doesn't become a job. It becomes a privilege. It becomes a divine entrustment. It becomes a joy. I don't believe that Jesus was miserable on the earth doing the will of the Father. For years, when I was in college, we would host ministry interns. You'd have individuals that had dreams of ministry, which typically, unfortunately, that means a pulpit, a microphone. And they'd come in, and you would give them opportunities to serve. A lot of them would be zealous and they would get that task done and they would say to me, okay, I'm, I'm ready for leadership. And the fallacy there is when you separate leadership from service, you're not preaching the gospel anymore. The kingdom of God is a totally upside down kingdom compared to the kingdom of this world so I want us to just close our eyes for a minute and if you could just dream with me for a minute about being the servant of all. And I want you to imagine the pleasure of God, His joy. This is not a consequence. You're not being punished. You're not being looked over. You're actually being looked at. Let me define entitlement for us. It's the belief that someone is inherently deserving of special privileges and treatment. The belief that someone is inherently deserving of special privileges and treatment. We, we need that worked out of us. In fact, I've realized I actually have to be very intentional 
I have to be aggressive to work that out of me. I, 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 the carnal nature, the insidiousness of pride and arrogance in the human heart is so real that I have to almost force myself into positions to stay low and humble before him. What are ways that we can position ourselves in a coming season to go low? What are ways that we can intentionally get looked over? And little do people know, I might be looked over in the eyes of man, but I've actually got God gazing on me because I'm not doing it to be seen. My wife and I talk about this a lot. You know, back in the day, people would bring their gift, talking about the gift that God has given them, the gift of hospitality, the gift of serving, the gift of music, the gift of, and they would offer it up freely before the Lord. Do you remember those days? They recognize what I have is not mine. They recognized my gift is not for me. It's to edify the body. And so how, however and whenever I can be a service, I willingly lay down my gift for God. Does anybody remember those days? Now, no one wants to offer their gift unless they're in a position to be seen or paid. Do you know why I don't charge to preach? Well, one, Paul said not to. But two, I'm never, ever, 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 ever going to decide whether I'm going to preach somewhere based on how much they can give me. Never, ever, ever, ever. In fact, I'm going to intentionally look for opportunities where they can't pay me, and I'm going to go and preach and give them an offering. Oh, you better believe it. You know, when I, when I talked about, I've taught you guys about making your money serve eternity. I'm talking as well about making your gifts serve eternity. I, I'm talking about intentionally using the God gifts that he's given you in such a way where you're going out of your way to bow low and not care about recognition or being uh, paid a favor or in exchange. I know I, I don't, I'm free from that. And I find it very strange in the church that charismatics get so worked up about our kids and the devil Disney you know and so charismatics we 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 rage against the antichrist and what and the school systems and and the kids they're coming after our kids and, I mean, you know, charismatic, they can get riled up. And then there's no kids' church workers unless you pay them. I, I don't understand. I, I, 
I don't understand. I, I sort of have like a, a kingdom mindset that says like, if this is what the devil can do, I'm going to go as far out of my way as possible to outdo him in the opposite spirit. So like what what happened because it a lot of this servant and pouring out and it didn't really what happened entitlement took over the American church culture we inherently begin to believe that we were owed for what we could give God so rather than trusting him Rather than falling in love with him and therefore getting delivered of performance, we've moved away from the foot washing servant and are modeling ourselves after a religious system. Jesus came to ca- challenge, and he would still come in 2022 and tear it down. Like you got to pay them or they're going to leave. Like Jesus didn't pay those guys. In fact, it was the exact opposite. They were going to pay him with their life. I mean, it just is such a, oh, what would we do if we could just do it for love? Like, Lord, I just need like a holy ghost car wash tonight, human wash. Just need you to wash off me the entitlement and the pride and the ego. The American church pitfalls and trappings. And before we go too far, Jesus associated serving with discipleship. So a disciple is one who obviously gets into the word and gets transformed and then they put it to work and work it out. We were created in Christ Jesus to soak in the prayer room, not we were created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works. I like what John Piper says. The point of Jesus washing his disciples' feet was so that none of his disciples would ever say of any act of service that's beneath me. The point of Jesus' foot washing was so that none of his disciples could ever say about any act of service, this is below me. Thank you, Lord. Verse 8, John 13, Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. I mean, a ding dong again. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only. Here we go. Good, good answer, Will. Also, my hands and my feet. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed, needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean and you are clean but not all of you this is his perfect moment to call out Judas why even waste the time washing the guy's feet he's a liar 
He's a fake. He's a fraud. He's a betrayer. Verse 12, so when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so am I. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, Neither is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Who likes feet? (laughs) Who doesn't like feet? Nasty things. Whenever I go to the masseuse, I'm like, my socks are on, don't touch my feet. can imagine back in the day there's been so many good sermons and commentaries written I won't belabor the point but you can imagine this act of washing feet was a very nasty was a think of something radical outlandish bizarre and again with 24 hours notice He chooses this. Now you and I have much longer than 24 hours. I believe the Holy Spirit is encouraging many of us in this room to take this entitlement thing. Because I've done this, because I've arrived, because I know this, I inherently am deserving of. Now the point is that might be true. I'm not saying that you're not worth X, Y, and Z. But there's a difference between walking in entitlement, demanding, versus knowing what you're worth but being led by the Holy Spirit and trusting Him every step of the way. Wow, brother. Remember an old preacher sat me down. It's a true story. 2015, I was preaching in mega churches around the nation. He was concerned for me. This guy sits me down and he talks to me, Jeremiah, you need to know how much you're worth. And I truly believe his intentions were somewhat pure. He said, you have a national ministry growing. You're traveling at these different places. He says, you're, you're moving up in ministry. You got to make a decision right about now to place a value on what you carry. Don't go to places and just preach for free or trust the Lord. You've got to place a demand on the anointing on your life. And it really is how it is in that world. I hate to tell you that. I I can, though, because I've been there. It's just a simple pay for play. It's a transaction. It's no longer a divine calling. And again, hear me. I'm I'm not saying, I mean, we obviously took up an offering tonight we want to be a blessing to people but I think you can cross a line it's an issue of the heart I just looked at this father and I said man I 
I feel like I know where you're coming from. I appreciate you. But this sounds more like Pharisees than Jesus. He said, I, I, don't, I don't see on any occasion where he wasn't taking the low seat. I see him going into the houses of sinners. I see him washing the feet of his disciples. I see the only time he allowed himself to be lifted up was on a cross. So, Father, I just ask, even in this room, to start landing the plane, God, that you would just purify us tonight. That you, you would purify our motives, our intentions, our demands. Some of you are even looking for doors. And I hear the Lord saying, right now you're too tall to get through the door. You're going to miss the door I'm trying to open up for you if you don't get low. Help us, Holy Spirit, to hear what you're saying tonight. Lord, how can we go out of our way to serve? you to turn over to Matthew 20 and we'll close. This is one of my favorite funny. I just think this is hilarious. So we got to read it. So I want you to know it, it was a real thing amongst the disciples about who was going to be Jesus's favorite. There's a real game going on in the body of Christ about who can be most popular. There's a real competition in every city in America about who has the biggest church. Oh, it's, a, it's real. It was real back then, and it's real now. So we're going to read Matthew 20, 20, and the reason why I think it's funny is because their mama got involved. <laughs> and you know when mama gets involved, she wants what she wants. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him, Jesus, with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. If you could just circle bowing down and just write false humility, that would be great. Because there's a religious way of bowing down before the Lord with motivation and intent to get what we want that needs to be exposed. They walk in there with their mom and do a little courtesy bow. And here's what they say. He said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink the cup? that I am about to drink. They said to him, we are able. Again, in their mind, 
they're associating leadership without service, without suffering. They said, yeah, we're ready. We're able. Verse 23, he said to them, my cup you shall drink. We know what he's talking about. Death. If you want to be great, I need you to be last. And hearing this, verse 24, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. Why don't you just hang with me five more minutes. Jesus is using the illegitimate demands of his disciples and their mama as a teaching moment in reference to the realm of leadership that was understood in that culture. I'm telling you, humility and servanthood is as foreign in the church today as it was in the days of Jesus. Jesus says, you know, Gentile leadership, pagan structure, where those who are great are seated in high positions of authority. But I, the suffering servant, have come to introduce you to a kingdom where those who are great are last. Those who I love most suffer most. Those who have the most pleasure of the Father have the most desire to not be seen by men. Verse 26, it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, in the pagan world, humility and radical servanthood was seen as a vice, not a virtue. Humility and servanthood was seen as a weakness. It was not esteemed. It was not treasured. It was not something to be desired. I mean, think with me the whole, why did they miss him? Because he came with authority and used all authority to take the lowest place where they thought he was coming to bring his authority to overthrow the Roman Empire. Oh God, if you could get a generation that would take their gifts and their talents and the authority that you've given them and let them race to the lowest space. They've got the American Idol contest. We've got the American Church contest. Just want to encourage you, don't sign up for the tryout. Philippians 2. I'll close with this. Paul writes and says, Do nothing out of selfishness or vain glory, but with humility in mind. Let each one of you 
regard one another as more important than himself. With humility in mind, let each one of you regard one another as more important than himself. John Wesley observed that neither the Romans nor the Greeks, listen to this, the Romans and the Greeks literally did not even have a word for humility. I don't, I don't even know if we're, we're even touching it tonight. I just... What, what Jesus came and, and brought and demonstrated and taught was like, you want to talk about a mic drop? Mind blow. I mean, they... You're not even on the radar. This was a strong and mighty, and look at me and look at my gifts and my talents and what I can accomplish in my own strength and what I can build and, 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 and market and brand for myself. Look at me. And Jesus comes and starts modeling and operating in a realm of humility and servanthood that and again think of it 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 had such an impact on his disciples that for love they were willing to give up their own lives for the kingdom the Greeks prided themselves on being better than other men They considered it something to be proud of, to acknowledge their superiority. The very concept was so foreign and abhorrent to their way of thinking, humility, that they had no term to describe it. When? During the first several centuries of Christianity, pagan writers borrowed this phrase with humility in mind because to them, humility was weakness. So they even, he had to borrow this phrase with humility in mind to even try to drop a concept in their mind of the kingdom of God. I want to encourage us tonight in love. Let it not be so with us. In other words, no matter what the church culture around us, to me this has everything to do with not only having a heart to serve and give, But this also comes with what kind of expectations do I come with to Christian community? Well, we just need family in the church. Amen. Thank God in family. We have to be more than takers. We have to be givers. Hello. Because if dad doesn't go to work, I think sometimes our rendition of Christian community and family is we're looking for a group where I can suck the life out of them. I'm looking for a group that can serve me. Well, you hear a lot of people, they're wounded by a message like this. Brother, I was a part of a church or ministry and all they taught was serving. It was another prayer meeting and another fast and another outreach. And I meet thousands of them around the body. I mean, they they are 
they felt like they did every kind of act of service known to man and somehow lost Jesus in the midst of it. If that's you tonight, that's part of your background or your history, I want to encourage you. People don't burn out in the kingdom of God because of service. People burn out in the kingdom of God because of why they did service. It's like this, we're, 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 we're being liberated from, you know, whatever, corporate church services, or we've been liberated, you know, it's like this, you know, you start dialoguing with people, you're trying to track with them, okay, where, where, where did the bitterness or disillusionment or like where, where did you fall off the track? And they fell off the track when they stopped doing it for love. Talking about love of God. When we started doing it for man, when we started doing it to be seen, when we started doing it for position and title, you jumped on the orphan activate competition Ferris wheel. And there was never enough that you were going to be able to attend or do to earn the love of God. I mean, I, I, I'd love to mess with your thinking. People will do for love what they'll never do for duty. We don't believe that. We just feel like you have to religiously shame and guilt trip and obligate people to do stuff for God. We're afraid if we set them free in love relationship with him, they'll get lazy. So in order to get people to tithe, we got to tell them, God's going to curse you, brother, if you don't give. Stop, ri- stop robbing the tithe from God. And it's just this. So Jesus makes this statement. Unless your righteousness exceeds or surpasses that of the Pharisees, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, what's the righteousness of the Pharisees? They tithed, they fasted. What else? They attended. Hold on now, though. I thought I'd been freed from the law and I'm under grace. Jesus said, if your righteousness, what's he saying? If your religious deeds don't exceed theirs, you won't make it into the kingdom. People today out of their wounding believe I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. So now I get a free pass from religious works because I'm resting in grace and his love. They don't realize if you were resting in real grace and real love, you'd be doing more, not less. I, again, I believe people have swallowed entitlement, not grace. So again, I'll apply it. It's like, all right, 10%. We already took up offering. Let's talk about money. Don't be scared. I've done this a bunch around here. 10%, the law. Give 10%. Well, brother, I've been freed from the law. We're under the new covenant not bound by that anymore I say amen because under the law in your own strength you had to give 10 are you now telling me under grace in his strength you can give less think about how crazy that thinking is these people think they got some great new covenant revelation and they're under deception No, under grace, 10% is no longer the maximum. It's the minimum. 
dude, I just set you free in the, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Stop going to your church and you made seven, $700, 701 this week and your tithe check is 70, you know, 71 point round up, please. Get delivered of religion. Well, brother, I don't tithe anymore. No, what you mean is you can feel good that you gave 2% to the poor and 1% to voice of the mark, and you're not even close to 10. Stop. You're living in deception. No, when the love, the grace, the mercy of God gets into your finances under a new covenant, You'll do more for love than you ever did for some guy trying to curse you because you, you can't give. And I'm kind of like, I'll show him. Serving. Man, if I felt like I burned out serving at this and serving at that, I'm going to allow the grace and the love of God to get down so much inside of me that I stop serving for love and I serve from being loved. So you, you, can, you, can, you can literally have such a deep encounter with the love of God that you never again play an instrument, be a greeter at a church, work in the kids' care, trying to pay God back for your salvation. You don't have to ever do it again to find your worth, value, and your significance. We don't use ministry to find our identity in God. We only find our identity in Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, I'm telling you, we've got this thing so twisted. We've got people thinking that they're free and they're deceived. When the grace of God falls down on a community it's not less giving it's not less service it's not less it indeed is more and the difference is the motivation and the intention of the heart what I couldn't do in religious obligation and striving when his grace and mercy got in me and empowered me to serve him and love him and get down low. And even if I'm the only one getting down low, if I'm the only one giving extravagantly, if I'm the only one and I'm saying, Lord, where's everybody else? I'm just going to take time to stare in the eyes of Jesus who's right down there with me saying, let it not be so with you. Bow your heads with me. I feel in my heart tonight like we're supposed to reject categorically any, any manner of Christianity that comes against humility and servanthood. So, God, in Jesus' name, all, all over this room, God, I'm, I'm the first. Lord, I'm, I'm asking, Holy Spirit, that you would help us. I want to give you 30 seconds and just process with the Lord. Invite him in. feel a grace in the room from striving Lord I just pray that you take us 
out of the duty room and move us into the beauty room. Lord, we just look at you tonight with fresh eyes. Lord, we say that you're our prize. You're our reward. That your words of affirmation and love are way more precious and valuable than any word of affirmation by men. Roberts told a dream that he had later in his life where he went to heaven. He saw this gigantic mansion, this beautiful home and treasure. And he said to the Lord, is this my heavenly reward for all the service over the years? The Lord said, no, I just wanted to show you what you would have had. If you hadn't to take credit for it on the earth. Guys, I really just in sobriety want to submit to you. There's a lot of people that will have their reward in full on the earth and will have none in heaven. Father, we pray for opportunities now. <laughs> I just encourage you to be careful, though. <laughs> God, we pray for opportunities to get low. Ways we could be of service to you. God, I, I just, I feel in this room there's so much gifting and talent and grace of the Lord Jesus. Just hear like the Lord is saying to some of you. For fear of self-promoting yourself. Don't bury the talents I've given you. I want to say that one more time. For fear of self-promotion. Some of you fear what I'm talking about the Lord says don't jump in the other ditch and be like that one I gave a talent to and he did nothing with it just hear God's heart for that group of people just saying I know your heart only I know the motivation behind why you do what you do Lord, use the deposit that you've given us inside of each and every one of us for your glory. Born in a manger. King of the whole world, born in a manger. The king of the whole world, 24 hours, he's going to wash feet. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord.
just open up your heart. Just open up your heart. Let him come and wash you and cleanse you, revive you. God, I pray for any of us. I feel like the Lord is saying there's folks in here. You've jumped in the other ditch. His hand is trying to pull you up. feel like this fresh call to serve the master I feel like the Lord is saying I'm not here to hand out towels you are the towel I actually want to take your life wrap it around brokenness want to take your life and wrap it around situations and circumstances I had a dream this past week where I walked into a church and saw these snakes and the guy was like trying to kill him and I took a towel and I wrapped around these snakes started killing them Lord says, Jeremiah and my church today, they've forgotten that a kind word turns away wrath. They've forgotten that the way to overcome evil is with good. I'm just, I'm believing for something radical, guys. Like radical giving, radical serving. Like, why in the world would you do that kind of acts? I just feel like I have to step on one more toe. Are you ready? You can put your toes back if you want. I just want you to hear the heart of God. I feel like I have the heart of God. I just want to use an example. A lot of us have been blessed. Some of us in this room were wearing shoes, new shoes, expensive shoes. Some of us are wearing clothes that we bought recently. They're nice. We have these opportunities that come up in life to give to the poor and give to the needy. And I wonder why we don't at least give them the shirt off our back. You know what we do to the poor and needy? We give them stuff we don't even wear. We give them worse stuff than we have and allow ourselves to feel good about it. Could I introduce you to the kingdom of God? Here's what the kingdom of God would do. It would actually buy that person better than you have. Oh yeah. Again, I want, I, want, I want you to, yes, imagine that playing out and what kind of impact that would have on that person. That's what kind of impact Jesus had coming to planet Earth, blowing up the Greek and Roman mindset concerning power and authority.
right. So I want to pray for opportunities to be a blessing to someone. Don't give them a hot dog. Buy them a steak. Don't give them your floor change. Reach for the 20. Well, I don't have anything in my checking. I'm not talking checking. How about your savings? You're going to go blow it on vacation anyways. All right, folks, I'm daring because I'm telling you, when the kingdom gets in you and you get infected with the kingdom virus, ooh, telling you people they don't people don't know what to do with kingdom people they they got so many tools and car and you're like bro just stop all right he loves you he really does he loves his people we serve a great god thank you for coming this weekend